More and more in today's modern world, we find out that taking safety and security on the internet seriously is nothing to shake a stick at. An awesome way to make sure that you're staying safe online is with NordVPN. NordVPN hides the things you do on the internet from bad people that want to steal your information. This prevents people from stealing your data and stopping your personal data from being sold by your internet service provider to advertisers. NordVPN has over 5,000 servers in 62 countries. You can use the internet like you're doing now, but anonymously in a much safer way. When I knew nothing about VPNs, I had always thought it was some kind of sweet hacker trick that was difficult to set up and use. But what blows my mind is how simple they've made it over at Nord. You look at the map, click on the server, and boom, you're connected. If you're like me, I started to wonder if I could access streaming services from the place that I just connected to, but surely that's just too good to be true. Well, guess what? It is possible with NordVPN. If there are YouTube videos you want to watch but are blocked in your country, Nord can easily fix that. It works on your computer, on a variety of operating systems, and it even works on mobile and tablets. Right now, you can go to nordvpn.com slash exil and get 70% off NordVPN. That's only $3.49 a month, plus you get an additional month free, or you can use coupon code exil. Once again, thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get to our feature presentation. LeBlanc is a champion that has an interesting and dynamic history. She's been around for a long time, always being one of the more popular mid lane champions, on top of also being one of the most hated. It's hard to deny her relevance in League of Legends because she is loved by those who main her and despised by the opposition. Is she fun? Absolutely. Is she problematic? Well. Yeah, this leaves Riot with a champion that's given them a couple of issues. They either have to figure out what they can do to make her healthier, meaning more counterplay, visual clarity, and more fair gameplay, or just try to leave her as she is, both of which have been rough at times. Sometimes when they need to rework a champion, they will tackle a problem in groups. Tons of changes to an entire class of champions. It's been a while since we've seen one of these, but do you remember class updates? We've had the tank class update, the mage class update, the marksman class update, and the assassin class update. Actually, come to think of it, the reason why we haven't seen a proper support or fighter class update is probably because a lot of these were messy and a few ended up being a complete failure. Remember how they kind of screwed up ADCs two different times? Sorry, Marksman. Yo, I have a question about the Aatrox rework. Uh, can you guys PLEASE REFER TO CRIT ITEMS? Anyway, one of those class updates was for the Assassins, which dropped on patch 6.22 to kick off pre-season 7. Years later, the results aren't the best. Rengar's update turned him into a bruiser with his infamous swim cue that nearly every Rengar main did not like. Zed had that AD bonus put onto his ultimate to grant him higher bonuses based on his target's AD, which made him specifically good against Jin, but other than that, it wasn't very well received and was eventually removed. Shaco's changes left him in an arguably worse spot in the meta, and without a doubt, he was even less healthy and harder to balance. Shaco would get another rework and another update years later, which reverted a lot of the changes and added some new ones, so he kinda needed a second rework, and Akali also got some new moves with the Assassin update, but would still require another full-on visual gameplay update to reimagine the champion, and we all know how that turned out. Finally, for LeBlanc, well, it's complicated. LeBlanc's lead designer was Koronok, who you guys in the comments did point out that in the Yorick video, he has a name that coincidentally represents something major in world events right now. Man, life is funny, isn't it? Anyway, he came up in the Yorick video because he was the lead designer behind Yorick back in Season 1. Truthfully, despite what you might think about some of his champions, and even what my videos might portray, he's definitely done a lot more good for this game than bad. He has a ton of experience as a game developer, he worked on a couple of big projects before even joining Riot, and now he's at Respawn. Anyway, it's hard to hate on Koronok too much because the man almost single-handedly was responsible for Lee Sin. 
but he also designed Poppy and Yorick, two of the worst design champions imaginable, so I guess that's just life. You win some, you lose some. Given the challenges of releasing three straight mages, Koronak and the rest of the team would make sure that all three of these champions were distinct. The original gameplay concept for LeBlanc was around her being a tank, but they found that concept to fit much more for Swain and his drain tanky spell vamp playstyle. So they had their three mages, Swain, Lux, and LeBlanc, and they all found their niche. Swain was the drain tanky caster, Lux would be the long range artillery support caster, and LeBlanc would be the assassin high skill and energy caster. The first ability that they solidified into the kit was Distortion, her most iconic and most unchanged ability throughout the years. She has always had the ability to jump in, do AoE damage, and jump back. That has never changed. After finding out just how much they loved Distortion, the rest of the kit was conceived around it. For the first four years of her existence, LeBlanc's Q was called Sigil of Silence, and when you proc the mark, it silenced the target. This, on top of her early game dominance, is what contributed the most to players not liking playing against the champion. It felt like at times that you didn't have much control over the laning phase, because if you decided that you wanted to CS at some point, she could just jump in and kill you. Veteran League players will remember the terrors of DFG LeBlanc, but one thing that I did not expect when researching for this video is how little she was used in competitive play during those years. LeBlanc was far from a troll pick, but she fit the definition of a solo queue pub stomper a lot more than I already thought. There's a video covering specifically the competitive history of LeBlanc by Glomperful. One thing that he touches on is that LeBlanc was not played a single time at World Championships until 2015. This means that in all of those years of her having a silence, she was never played once at Worlds. Of course, she would still see regular play in LCS, LCK, and other tournaments throughout the years, but for the first four years of her life, the World Championship is something that she was never seen in. What made her so strong in average Joe solo queue was also kind of the very thing that made her less popular in competitive play, and that was snowballing. If there's ever been one word to describe how you win on LeBlanc, it would be killing. You would be hard pressed to find another champion as reliant on running train and owning noobs as this one. What does LeBlanc even offer if she's not a full item or more ahead of her opponent? If she's not three items with a death cap blowing up a one item ADC with no magic resistance who is already one in eight, why even play LeBlanc? Why not play a different champion? Thankfully, she has tools to get fed, with an excellent early game point and click burst damage with the QR combo, AoE damage with W, and superb safety from being ganked and shut down with her passive in W, she can fulfill her bloodthirsty fantasy, and she's particularly good at stacking up that mage eyes. Where she's always run into trouble is if the enemy has a counter pick ready. Quickly, your feast or famine champion will be starved if you don't execute LeBlanc to perfection. And even then, it's not always a guarantee. Remember the finals of MSI in 2015 with SKT versus EDG? Faker at the time was 12 in 0, undefeated on LeBlanc in professional play, and he would end up being counterpicked by a niche Morgana mid lane, suffering his first defeat on the champion. Faker's LeBlanc, one of the best. Yes, sir. The yes, world. Sir. He locks it in for game five. Faker has never lost with LeBlanc on the competitive stage. Now he has it here. This could so, be explosive. Alistar has already been locked in for the support. Malka has been locked in for the top lane. And now Morgana is being picked by EDG. Elixir of Sorcery on him as well to get out a bit of extra damage. Goro finds him with the twisted advance as he pulls back the distortion and he can't get out alive. Marin's forced to turn as soon as he nars out. Unfortunate for SKT and EDG is smiling here to hear. It is scary how many ways EDG has of locking down this LeBlanc here. The Morgana counterpicking lane. Malga just point on clicking on Faker when he jumps in. Now, it's safe to say that obviously Faker losing on LeBlanc for the first time was not the reason that she was reworked. That is completely clear. Just because he finally lost wasn't a bad thing. In fact, it was actually kind of a good thing for the game because he was counterpicked and give credit to EDG. They had a good game plan and a good strategy. They came prepared and it worked. 
The point is that you have to think about it in the bigger picture and in the scope of the game as a whole. Riot likes to see a more consistent pattern for their champions, which is also kind of the reason champions like Jace, who are super good in lane, and Kasten, who are super good late game but terrible in lane, have been receiving many changes throughout their years of League of Legends games. It is so important that LeBlanc wins her lane, to a fault even, so that her gameplay graph kind of looks like this. When playing against an easy matchup, like a scaling mage with limited mobility to the tune of a Ziggs or a Vagar, she will overpower them. At no point until the very late game do these champions stand a chance, and with the slightest of leads, LeBlanc will end the game. But when LeBlanc plays against a bad matchup like a Morgana or a Cassidan, wins become so infrequent it's almost unfair in the opposite end of things. Sometimes playing LeBlanc feels like there's nothing you could have done to win the game because you got counterpicked so hard, which ironically is the same thing that the Ziggs or Velkaz player probably felt playing against a LeBlanc. This is unhealthy, especially to this level of extremes. Ideally, her design would be somewhere closer to an equilibrium. You want to be able to find a point in which she still does what she wants to do, but she doesn't completely ruin the game for other champions. This was and is not unique to her either, by the way. With the Assassin update, we also got the Stealth rework and the Pink Ward and Control Ward rework, where they took on the same philosophy. This is their quote about the Vision Wards and the new stealth mechanics. Across League's history, we haven't done a great job of handling these traits separately. Case in point, Vision Wards are the one-size-fits-all counter to stealth, regardless of what enemies are trying to do while unseen. To keep things generally balanced, we've had to give stealth champions more overall power to offset situations when pink wards shut them down, and that makes them overbearing when wards aren't in play. There's simply not enough middle ground. Although she isn't directly named in this paragraph, if you played during this time, you probably know who they were trying to talk about, the old Akali. The best way of explaining why stealth had to be reworked is by looking at the interaction between pink wards and the old Akali Shroud. The old Akali was a terror on the rift. She had three point and click long range dashes, tons of healing, point and click damage, and stealth that made you want to pull your hair out. So when she kills you 30 times in a row in bronze elo, how come every single pro didn't insta lock her every single game? Surely this champion was so broken, right? Well, two words. Pink wards. Akali's gameplay pattern looked a lot more like this. She was broken beyond belief when the enemy doesn't have a pink ward to counter her shroud, and almost every single thing in the game can counter you easily just by placing a consumable item that costs roughly 75 or 100 gold. This was lame for both the Akali player and for the opponent, which is why stealth was reworked to begin with. So understanding all of that, this brings us to LeBlanc's rework. Riot's notes on why LeBlanc was changed are pretty understandable given what we've talked about so far. When it comes to identity, LeBlanc's intended to be a fast-paced, combo-oriented assassin that uses misdirection and deceit to make her opponent's head spin. In reality, however, things play out a little differently. While combos are certainly the name of LeBlanc's game, her largest issue is how little deceiving and misdirecting she actually ends up doing. When your biggest mind game ability is also the one you use to double cast to blow somebody up, something's gotta give. With her update, we are letting LeBlanc make more tricky plays than ever before. By utilizing Mimic either to create a split second diversion in the heat of an all in, or creating a global distraction to fake out unsuspecting side lanes, your success with LB will depend as much on your creativity as your mechanical skill. This is interesting because as we said, this is similar to what we've talked about so far, but one thing we haven't covered yet is her tricky nature, a champion based around deception. It's clear that their goal was to think more along the lines of Shaco here. Shaco and LeBlanc are obviously different champions, but one thing that's always been interesting, especially with the AP Shaco variant, is how a very good Shaco player can really outsmart and deceive his opponents. Pink Ward literally spawned his career off of making people look silly with AP Shaco. And as awesome as that is, it kind of feels like that's what LeBlanc should have been doing the entire time, and that's where the changes to Mimic come in. 
Her new ultimate with the rework gave her tons of choices, way more tricky tools, and a completely new global mechanic with her Mimic R. With all of these new tools and fancy mechanics, did they achieve what they set out to do? Well, no, that's why she was reverted. Anyone could have guessed that. That's why I'm making this video right now. But the question is why? Since we were just talking about gameplay curves, let's talk about one of the biggest problems with the rework, which was that her gameplay curve really wasn't fixed. The original LeBlancs early and mid-game were phenomenal, but then later on into the game, she fell off a cliff. The reworked version of the champion looked more like this. While it's true they made her into a more consistent champion, as she could function better in her bad matchups, this was definitely something they wanted to do with the rework. It wasn't at the cost of the good matchups though. The problem is that this version of LeBlanc was the best scaling version of the champion we've ever seen. The late game burst was off the charts as expected, I mean just look at those AP ratios, but the consistent healing and DPS from her passive bouncing all around the place also meant that the Gunblade LeBlanc was a solid split pusher. On top of all of the insane parts about her kit, I think the thing that was most broken by far was that she would become this pseudo rise 30 to 40 minutes, not nearly as good as a rise, but functionally being able to do some of the same things while having probably the best laning phase of any mid lane champion. Decently strong late game, new side lane split pushing with teleport, absurd healing and drain tanking with the gunblade build, plus even more tools to juke her opponents, it made her one of the strongest champions ever to see competitive play. Looking at the stats for 2017, it really backs up this claim, because for the entire year, all of Season 7, she was the most banned champion in the world for pros, with the highest presence in the world as well, at a whopping 1500 bans. In addition to all of the new parts to her kit that made her really strong, her new mimic is also something that we have to talk about. Having the power to pick which ability that you want to mimic is a huge change. At first glance it might seem like a quality of life or very minor but fairly nice buff, but in reality this is a game changer, and being only able to pick your most recently used ability is a bit of a crutch, but with great power comes great responsibility. It's also what keeps her neutered to some degree. It goes without saying that combos that are normally impossible were now doable, something completely unheard of such as throwing your chains into a distortion into another chain could now be done. Dude, I like LeBlanc, man. You can do so many things with her now, like so many outplay potential. So much outplay potential. My god. Oh my god. And because it really wouldn't make any sense to allow you to pick which ability you want to mimic if you couldn't pick ones that are on cooldown, because most of the time you would just end up using your most recently used ability anyway, unless of course you had all of your abilities up at once, it also made her nearly impossible to stop as a split pusher, because with her new bounce wave clear after you WQ'd a wave, your W would go on cooldown, so you would think that if you were caught right after clearing a wave, you would have no dash to use, but that wasn't the case. If you had your R up and you were split pushing, you could essentially treat it like distortion was always ready, or any other ability that you wanted, if you wanted your chain or your Q, it was always ready. The thing is, if they added more power into her ultimate, which they did, they had to take it away somewhere, and the biggest knock against the rework is that they gave her this arming or cook timer that was 1.5 seconds on the mark. Without a doubt, it first seems like instant proccing on the queue is way better than a 1.5 second delay. Instant versus 1.5 seconds, it seems pretty easy. But you have to think about this for a second. It's kind of hard to compare the different versions of the mark because having the mark on her passive versus having it on her Q are entirely different abilities. Just because the mark was delayed one and a half seconds does not mean it's worse. In fact, in almost every single way, this passive was way, way better than the mark on Q, even though it wasn't instant. And the reason is that it could be applied on everything. It was your passive. You could mark multiple targets, including minions, by just hitting your W. If you ever landed your chain, you were guaranteed to do more damage just with E because the chain duration was 1.5 seconds. No Q needed 
needed whatsoever. Just use your E to pop your passive. Effectively, at the end of the day, what you had with this rework was an incredibly strong Rise LeBlanc split pushing assassin hybrid with all of the tools in the world to succeed, having a much more consistent performance in every game, and the LeBlanc mains themselves weren't even fond of it either because they hated not being able to QRW instant proc, as they felt like waiting on the passive was lame. So let's get this straight. People didn't like playing against it, pros really hated playing against it and they banned her all the time, and the mains weren't satisfied either, so a revert was inevitable. It's a no-brainer. So it's easy to say that I would be an outlier, especially within the LeBlanc main community, to say that I felt this was a more fun and interesting champion than the current version of LeBlanc. And I just spent all of this time telling you why it's so broken and was pretty rough. So I guess I have some explaining to do, don't I? It seems pretty obvious just to default to say that the only reason I liked this so much was because it was so blatantly overpowered. But I've just spent a huge chunk of this video explaining what made her so unfair. I acknowledge that she was very, very overtuned in a lot of different ways, but I can still attempt to explain myself and explain to you why I actually think this was pretty interesting. Early on, we spoke about how Riot failed on several of the champions in the Assassin class update. We talked about Rengar, Shaco, and Zed and Akali, how these were pretty much total failures. But we didn't look at the ones that ended up being a success, which were Katarina and Talon. Certain Assassin reworks didn't change all that much in the champion's kit, so it was easy to ensure that the champion wouldn't be hated very much. It was kind of like Fizz and Echo, for example. They were so small in what was actually changed that you probably forgot they even got a little bit of a rework during this time. It was just big enough to make a long-term impact, though. When Fizz throws his shark, you know how it gets bigger and stronger the farther that it travels? That was updated with this patch. That was when that was implemented. The reason that I kind of forgot about it, and the reason I forgot that wasn't always in his kit, was because it was such a natural and understandable change. Talon and Katarina were completely different. They were given huge updates with all new abilities, yet they haven't been reverted yet. The reason is because these reworks are actually pretty good. You will occasionally run into a Katarina main that will beg for the old cat back, but more often than not, the Katarina player base has been satisfied and happy with this version of the champion now more than three years later. And it's proof that Riot did a pretty good job with the rework because the champion is quite different from the old one, with entirely new mechanics like the daggers. Talon is similar, having his brand new parkour E and a ton of other changes, but it still felt like more of a natural extension of the champion and what he was trying to do, rather than something completely different. If you think about it, as Talon, your ultimate is still used the exact same way as it was pre-rework. The W is still the wave clear ability, and your Q is just a heavily upgraded version of the old Q. Since the point and click dash was removed from the old E to make room for the parkour, they gave him a dash on his Q, which actually feels kind nice. Nothing about Talon's rework screams at you that this champion wouldn't be loved by previous Talon players, and both Katarina and Talon instantly became more popular and relevant in higher ELO solo queue because of these changes. I bring this up because I feel like LeBlanc's rework was trying to be an extension of herself, rather than a whole new champion. She was so close to being like Katarina in Talon, but there was a couple of problems that never got solved that made her feel like Rengar in Shaco. Starting off, let's look at the number of options given to the LeBlanc player. With the rework came her new Global Mimic R, and this for the average LeBlanc player was a totally useless and pointless thing to do. And honestly, that's fine, because this was just one small part of her kit. It was never intended to rock the boat all that much. It was a very niche thing to use, but that's exactly what made it so cool. These were the little moments in games where it helped you juke your opponents, fake them out, make them blow a flash or fake a gank, or even block a skill shot for a teammate. These moments didn't happen very often, not even once per game. But when it did, it was special and fun. The other thing is the consistency of giving LeBlanc wave clear with the Shatter Orb and Bounce may have helped her balance in the long run, as the current LeBlanc has a huge problem where all of her power is tied into her W. It's so hard to farm and wave clear properly because they almost can't buff LeBlanc's W. 
Consistently, every single patch, LeBlanc almost always ranks among the lowest CS in the mid laner category, along with Silas, Pantheon, and Pike. And while it's true that a lot of these champions are roaming style champions, specifically Pike and Pantheon are meant to roam around the map and not CS, it's also because it's just so difficult to farm on LeBlanc. She is forced to use her W to CS, which is also her mobility spell, which is also her main source of poking the opponent, and it also means that Riot has no choice but to never buff her wave clear, because that would mean you would have to buff LeBlanc's W damage. Having so much loaded into one ability comes with obvious issues, and this rework aimed to fix that by allowing her to bounce her passive procs with Q. Let's go. That's so cool. In theory, the arm timer allows a squishy mage like a Ziggs or a Velkaz, who normally gets blasted by the matchup, to have some time to press their barrier or flash out of the way. That way they don't get instant procced. But in LeBlanc's bad matchups, the passive helping you wave clear allows you to hold your own and actually provide something for the team. At the time playing this version back in 2017, I had problems with the passive, namely that it didn't have a long enough cooldown on champions, and also that the E should not have popped the passive by itself. In the current version of LeBlanc, it makes sense that the E counts as two abilities. That way you can pop your Q mark by either hitting the chain directly, or you can throw a Q during the tether, that way when the chain pops, you get bonus damage. That part is fine for current LeBlanc that we play against every day. What is not fine is that when the mark is on your passive and it does that much damage, why can it be completely applied and popped by just the chain? Up is hell. So let's see. It, it, oh shit! Get me out! <laughs> Did I just one shot her with my chain? Speaking of the Gunblade, this interaction was never intended and all they had to do was treat the bounce as a proper AoE spell, not each individual bounce being a single target spell, which is why it healed so much. There's nothing wrong with nerfing Gunblade LeBlanc right away, because the champion was never meant to have that level of sustain. When your wave clear combo not only pushed the wave, but also harassed your opponent and also healed you for half your health, which allowed you to win every single trade, it's a problem. I sometimes believe that if Riot had taken more aggressive action to instantly remove the Gunblade build as soon as it got popular, maybe she would have never been reverted. Though at the same time, the LeBlanc player still didn't like the rework all that much, so maybe not. Although yes, allowing you to pick which mimic you want is a little bit problematic and I mentioned it before, I also think maybe it wouldn't have been as bad as you think if some of these other changes were implemented. Letting you choose what ability you want allows the creativity and the skill of the player to shine just a little bit more. This kind of thing, where you give the player more choices, is a slippery slope. If you give them too many options, you become overpowered, but if you don't give them enough choices, the gameplay feels too linear and feels outdated compared to today's modern champions that get to do everything. As I finished up this video, it was kind of a weird feeling that I got. Something came over me to think about how it is so interesting the way that this game changes and evolves over time, because this is something that kind of has a sad ending for me, but it's very different for a lot of other players who enjoy the same champion, and I don't hate the current version of LeBlanc by any means, she's one of my favorite champions in the game. But if you think about it, I'm not really asking for so much, am I? The craziest part about League of Legends is that I'm not asking to bring back everything from Season 1, I'm not asking to remove other champions from the game, remove parts of the map, bring back items that were removed, or remove entire items from the game. I just kind of preferred a different version of the same champion with slightly different abilities. Yet because this is an ever evolving game that always has to change and kind of work for everybody, with hundreds of millions of players it's completely impossible to make everybody happy. So as an individual you may never get to do exactly what you want to do, no different than any other player who's had their main champion reworked and they don't like the new rework. That was just kind of an interesting thought that I had when I finished researching this video and writing up the script. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you all next time.